All right, we're going to get started shortly. All right, it is now time for the final talk of TorCon 21. Uh, please welcome to the stage Jutton, uh, who's going to talk about a really awesome uh, way of uh, poning Cisco devices. Hi. Um, please let me know if I'm not here. Uh, you cannot hear me because when I was sitting back, uh, it was very difficult to understand the talk. Uh, so um, I'm Jatin Katapia. Um, I'm the principal scientist and uh, uh, architect of our defensive technologies at Red Balloon Security. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about defeating Cisco Trust Anchor, uh, a case study of recent advancement. And I haven't put Rick, who's the second author in this talk, but he's here. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and Ankur couldn't join uh, today. So uh, I'm going to start like uh, in this project, who were the cast, uh, who were the characters who helped me, uh, or actually together we uh, did this work. Uh, myself, uh, Rick Housley, who presented, uh, it was a great talk. Uh, Joey, uh, Ang, uh, James, uh, and Brian. He is the most important part in this whole talk. Uh, so it all started when uh, we started thinking about like uh, running, uh, you know, hacking up ASR 1001 because uh, we just wanted to, and we found out that uh, it was end of life. Uh, but and Cisco released in 2013 uh, ASR 1001X. They both looked the same, so it didn't matter, and we just bought it. Uh, and the main objective uh, of this uh, of this whole research was to run our software. Um, and uh, during this research, we found uh, uh, a trust anchor, uh, trust anchor vulnerability because when we worked on, we have been working on Cisco routers for the last 10 years, and it hasn't been that difficult to run uh, code on it. You basically, we, we are not looking for vulnerability. All we wanted uh, was to run our software on it. Um, and then we found out that in 2013, uh, Cisco implemented this uh, proprietary uh, bootloader verification, uh, basically their own proprietary secure boot based on FPGAs. And, you know, uh, and this is the CVE for that. Uh, and uh, first I want to start with the impact of this vulnerability. So when we were working on it, uh, we thought that, you know, we'll be only impacting 1,000 series, right? Uh, and it will be just that. But we impacted 900, 920. 6,800, 9,500, 9,800, mm, more. Oh, wow, there is more. There, oh, 3,000, wait for it. Then there are ASA, then uh, there is uh, 9,700, and then, uh, oh, recently they updated this. This is actually their security appliances. And uh, I don't want to say it, but they did not release this before. <laughs> Um, so, you know, given that, uh, we thought, you know, like it's, uh, we have affected so many products, uh, now it's around 140 or something. So, we, Cisco, you know, becoming like uh, running around 60% of the uh, internet, uh, the world's internet, obviously not somewhere. Uh, but the, no the novel technique which we are proposing doesn't just affect routing infrastructure, it also affects weapon systems, ADAS systems in automotive, medical, ICS. So uh, what is this, right? We, we started with the hardware analysis, and which Rick was a great help, um, that uh, if you look at this diagram, right, B represent, uh, the A represents where the firmware uh, of the system is stored, right? Two SPI flashes, basically like your motherboard. Uh, C is an Intel x86 uh, core, uh, and uh, D is the South Bridge. B and E are more interesting. Uh, so E is the Xilinx FPGA, which we didn't know when we started this project, like it was the trust anchor. And B is where the bitstream is stored. And uh, if you look at the ASR analysis, and you guys were late, but I was here, so I know what is UEFI. And those guys did a good job in the morning. <laughs> so uh, as most, probably some of you guys are uh, uh, network admins, the, you guys know what is Ramon. Ramon is uh, Cisco's, you know, old-timey old proprietary bootloader through which you can boot different uh, iOS images. What Cisco did uh, was uh, started using UEFI, I think around 2013, when they shifted to this model, 
and uh, they implemented a pre-Raman, which what it does is that it manages Raman. It also uh, helps in upgrading the bootloader, managing the bootloader, um, and uh, which is implemented as an a PEI uh, phase in the UEFI, if you remember the chart from the morning. Uh, and uh, Raman is basically uh, the, it validates the operating system which will be loaded uh, later in the stage. Uh, it also has a really cool uh, uh, memory inspection uh, module which is disabled by default and you can, you know, enable, I, I, don't, I don't know if there is any uh, flag to do, uh, to do it, but you can modify the SPI and like enable it. And uh, so what it does is that it boots the Linux kernel, which is the operating system, and uh, the OS. But we are forgetting about Cisco iOS, the real iOS, not Apple iOS. Uh, what they did was they, take, they took uh, the old iOS and implemented, they literally took it and implemented it as a daemon in a Linux process. And that's what Cisco IS XE is, the latest and greatest from Cisco. So we started looking at the SPI and we looked at it. There were no hashes, uh, no certs. That should be really, because what we want to do is just run our software. That's all we care about. We don't care to mess up with Cisco. Uh, so we modified the UEFI and we disabled some pre on checks and booted the modified firmware. Everything worked, right? Easy peasy, done with the project, but wait, it reset it. So why is that? It exactly after 100 seconds, the, the router resets. And it shows like it tries three times to uh, uh, boot itself. And then, you know, after three times, it drops into Raman. No idea what it is. So then we started with some hypothesis. Like, you know, Intel has some really cool uh, uh, modes, like SMM, VMM. And uh, so we thought, like, maybe it's of a hyper they're, they're running a hypervisor, uh, which we couldn't see. In, but we saw that the VMM was disabled. And all of this was able to, um, we were able to do because we had 100 seconds to run whatever code we want, which is bizarre. Uh, so uh, then we disabled the watchdog timers. We thought maybe it's watchdog timers. Then we saw that the SMM was actually enabled. Uh, we disabled it, pretty easy. And it was still resetting. Had no idea what's going on. Nope. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we started with electromagnetic emanation. Like, we took a near-field probe. We wanted to know what was going on. And uh, we saw, this is just a hunch going on. You know, another Friday we were trying to do something. And uh, we saw that the FPGA was, uh, there, was a, there was some emanation coming out from the SPI, which means that the FPGA is coming up, reading its configuration, and we'll talk about FPGA later on. Uh, and then uh, FPGA does something, uh, probably some kind of computation, uh, and then the circuitry comes up. So some hunch that FPGA is doing something. And then we also sniffed the SPI bus. We saw some, uh, you know, uh, we, did, we, we saw that like a microloader is coming up, you know, the interrupt handlers, the bio stuff, the vBio stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, basically the E1000 and the F1000 uh, e to uh, hex 10,000 range, you know, because you have 100 seconds, you can do all the analysis you want to. We also looked at pre-Raman. We saw some weird checks. This is the range where usually in x86 architecture, external dev devices are mapped. And if you saw the RIG stock, you know, these are basically your memory mapped IOs. Uh, and uh, just for the sake of sanity, we hijacked the first instruction, wrote our own serial driver, and we saw that the system was literally shutting off. Uh, so what kind of entity is it? Like, there is some external entity. I don't know whether it's, you know, Jesus, Krishna, or Buddha. No idea. There is someone who's doing it. Uh, and uh, it was obviously Xilinx because it was sitting right next to the SPI bus. So obviously it's a bus master, some kind of. So this was the, this was the uh, you know, hunch. Uh, and that device powers on, FPGA reads itself, configures, configures itself, uh, passes, the, you know, validates the whole SPI, which is basically the pre ROM on, ROM on, Linux OS, iOS T, and does the whole uh, chain of uh, integrity checks. So um, FPGA reversing is hard, so I thought, you know, like, why not just buy it and, like, find the reset pin? But these things, even on sale, they are expensive. So um, 11 grand, uh, we went ahead and we found the reset pin. We had to destroy $10,000, and this is what $10,000 looks like. <laughs> uh, so we started it. Uh, we found the $10,000, and then I went to Rick. Um, you know, like, uh, RTL reconstruction is really hard. I don't want to do it. What should I do? I want to reset this pin. I want to keep this pin high. I don't want it to go down. And Rick said, uh, you know, why not just put a 10K ohm and, like, uh, should be okay. What, what bad could happen? 
$20,000. Gone. <laughs> resistors, uh, resistors cost $1 per ohm. Um, and this is how it looks in $20,000. So Joey, Joey is basically, uh, you know, great intelligence person, uh, basically said, you dum-dums, uh, there is a patent which basically talks about the exact same thing, where Cisco filed it in 2012, and uh, FPGA acts as a bus master, uh, validates, this is actually uh, what Open Titan is also doing, if you guys read recently, uh, and uh, what they are doing is, uh, you know, they validate the fact, uh, the uh, FPGA validates what uh, s perform some kind of computation, validates the certificates, go or validates the hash, and you know sends the microloader to CPU, and uh, allow the CPU to read the bitstream, uh, the the firmware from the SPI flash. It's just not that. Uh, after 100 seconds of reset, the way we could tell, and we did a lot of our analysis, was that the fan was going. Uh, uh, you know, fan used to make really high noise. That FPGA has tripped the system. So. Uh, and now from this, from this uh, patent, we were able to understand like it was controlling not just the SPI bus, but also all the other hardware peripherals. So, um, and we left the project around in 2017. Came back in 2018, down $20,000. I went to Ong and I said, I can do with this. I can basically reverse engineer FPGA. And he said, explain me FPGAs. So this is FPGA basics for humans. So what is an FPGA, right? Uh, it's, a, it's an IC that has uh, basically the advantages of both software and hardware, right? Uh, it, can do hard, uh, it, it can do computations uh, with uh, hardware and it can be configured like software. And uh, to explain you what it is, it's just, you know, so the developer provides you the HDL, uh, which is basically some kind of, uh, it's, it's a language and you write code in it. Uh, the vendor tool synthesizes it and then the mapping and the routing can be done by either the vendor or, Vendor, vendor tool chain or by the developer itself. And then you take, you know, all those truth tables, BRAM initialization, think about your BSS and, you know, stuff like that, if you're familiar with uh, ELF. Um, uh, you basically encode it into a binary, which is called a configuration bitstream, with which how you can program the hardware inside FPGA. And uh, there are multiple types of uh, FPGA as frame base, which is Cisco, uh, which Cisco uses. Uh, in this one, uh, you have to configure the FPGA each time the system reboots. Uh, the second one is the flash base in which the configuration bitstream uh, is living inside the die itself, so it's less power consumption and it like quickly boots up uh, as, with, um, as compared to SRAM where you have to read some volatile memory and configure it. And then add a fuse. I don't know why it's called FPGA because you cannot reconfigure it anywhere at all. But what really is FPGA, right? It's a, it's a combination of blocks, different IP blocks which can do something. Right? That's what FPGA is. And you know, those blocks I will come uh, ahead but I'm a mathematical person, a system person. What is FPGAs? Y is equal to FX. This is what FPGA is. If anyone talks about FPGA and talk a lot about and zap zap, it's Y is equal to FX. And all you care about is changing Y or X. You don't need to worry about F. And that's what our research shows. To complete the tutorial, uh, uh, IOB block is basically what drives the signal 0 and 1, right? It's, a, it's just a pin. Uh, IOI is what tells the pins uh, from the rest of the logics, the f of x, that, okay, drive it, I have com uh, I've computed the bo Boolean function, now this is one or zero. BRAM is just your RAM, right? You can configure it different ways. And the CLB is the element which, can, which does the Boolean functions, right? It consists of two slices, you know, it has flip-flops, lookup tables, and you can also act, uh, you can make it as a storage uh, component also. So how to reverse engineer FPGA? This is all you need to know, right? And there has been some previous work done, uh, you know, you can read about it. But uh, the, main, the main idea here is that uh, there are hundreds of, tens of thousands of uh, CLB components in FPGA. And uh, they are, you know, they're way too complex. Like, why do I want to go ahead and do this, right? Like, why, why do I want to, like, reverse engineer this? Because I'm a lazy hacker. I want to get things done. And uh, the IO pin count usually doesn't increase, right? Um, this is Spartan 6 family, which is what Cisco has been using. And if you see it, uh, the CLB count keeps on increasing, but the IO count doesn't. Like, it stays, uh, you know, 10, 15 linear uh, constant action. So this is uh, the SHA-256 algorithm. Like, this is the complexity we are talking about. This is just CLBs. And look at the routing in, uh, network here. Uh, you don't want to go ahead and, uh, you know, reverse engineer that. 
uh, and this is what I understand pretty well, is uh, that's the CLB encoding. In, uh, so this is the SHA-256, um, and um, this is how you can represent what the bitstream contains. So that's the logic. Uh, all the white ones are ones, and you know, all the purple ones are zero. This is what the configuration of the CLBs look like. And you look at the IOB, it's down there, and uh, it remains the same. Change a little, like I think one round or one constant, and this is how it all changes. And if you diff them, this is basically, it, you know, it validates our theory that all we have to do is like go after y and x because now we can apply it uh, uniformly to different bit streams, just changing those y's. So there are a few modification scenarios here. We want to change, we want to take the output, change uh, it from 1 to 0, 0 to 1, configure it to become an input, uh, and same thing goes with input uh, 1 and then reconfigure it to make it output. So these are the, config uh, these are the modification scenarios. Uh, and uh, what matters is that, you know, like even though what vendors have been, you know, trying to do is they are relying on the uh, obscurity, not like actually applying a good model in security. And uh, even though the RTL reconstruction is hard, changing I.O. is actually pretty easy. So let's go ahead and like how we do the bitstream reversing, right? There is, that's how we apply our uh, uh, firmware reversing. You know, you can... Bitstreams are uh, encrypted. You can apply different kind of glitching attacks. Uh, you know, you can do side channel analysis to figure out what uh, the encryption is, uh, the, uh, the the key is, and then you can basically uh, you know use uh, it to decrypt the whole uh, bitstream. And this is the development board uh, we use to do uh, our analysis. And how you unpack? You read this document. That's all you have to do. Go into this. Uh, go into this. Uh, go, go to this link. You know, I'm, I don't have to explain all of this. I'm running out of time, but. Uh, the, uh, this, this actually, we have done really good work in this, and uh, uh, it's very modularized. I would really recommend you guys to go ahead and add Altera and different families for Spartan. Uh, and then uh, how to, uh, an, uh, to look at the analysis, there are three types of frames. Uh, one is configuration logic, which basically contains the, uh, you know, the, how, what does the CLB does. Then there is BRAM, what the memory contains in the, in the bitstream, and the IOB, which we care about. Um, and there are certain device layout which matters, you know, that's, so if you go into the repo, we have uh, specified LX9 and LX45T uh, of the Spartan 6 series. Uh, each frame is 130 bytes. You can think of it like a matrix structure. Uh, there is row, columns, and columns itself is a matrix. Uh, and uh, you, all you have to do is like figure out what is the major info about that specific device. You, uh, you just put it in a JSON and our tool basically parses it. You specify the miner. Uh, this is how our tool looks like. I'm not a JavaScript person. Uh, uh, Alex from our team actually did a really good job in this. It shows you the resource utilization. This is uh, one of the demos. Uh, and uh, it exactly picks out which CLB, which type of CLB was being, uh, was being used, where in BRAM the data is. Uh, and this is how the Cisco uh, analysis look like. If you, if you look at it, right, there are multiple CLBs which are doing some stuff. There is PCI stuff, there is GTP uh, uh, trans receiver, there are a lot of stuff. Again, how to do the encoding, look at the link, it explains you. How to modify it, look at the link. And uh, how to repack, they use some weird 22-bit uh, CRC for sing single event upset during uh, flashing. Uh, they, you know, like, all you have to do is just uh, look at their uh, software and it will tell you how to do it. Uh, and uh, it... Oh. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, using the side channel analysis, you can figure out the key and you can encrypt it back. Uh, and there is also a register which allows you to bypass the CRC. You can try that. And uh, there, is a, there is an example in the repo which uh, explains you if you buy a Mojo board, which is uh, LX9, uh, it w and you have four pins on, you can turn it one off. And uh, it has been left to the reader how to determine, after this amazing tutorial, uh, how to turn it back on. So now, with this knowledge, I went to Ong and I wanted, I got $30,000. So, uh, and now the you know, idea was pawn the pin, pawn the ASR. But there are 246, 296 pins on the ASR and the LX45T, and I went to Rick again, and I said, how to figure out, I don't have that much time, because it's, a, it's a literally a flash, you cannot update it, and you have to take off the flash each time anything bad happens, uh, because, you know, it resets. So it takes around 15 minutes to retry the whole thing, one pin. So he used JTAG chain to find, uh, to find 10 pins out of 296, because 
Remember the fan which was making the noise? Uh, these were the 10 pins who change state after the uh, fan noise was made. So we focused on those 10 pins. Uh, was there? I don't think these 10 pins were used. Not sure. Uh, but then we, Brian, this is where uh, Brian comes in, uh, our automated bitstream extraction and testing uh, framework. So he was supposed to test 10 pins, uh, but in worst case, 296 pins. Great help. And uh, in the testing course, we lost another $30,000, uh, another $10,000. So this is how it looks like. Uh, and then we finally pawned the pin, you know, like we were able to uh, run modified firmware uh, because we were able to disable the FPGA to send a reset signal by reversing the FPGA bitstream. But now the idea was like, how can we go towards, you know, go to Cisco and because they're going to say that, how can you do it remotely? Turned out, uh, they actually update their trust anchor from Linux, which is supposed to be immutable. Uh, and uh, so there is a driver which they use called CPLD.ko, and there is also a driver called Quack.ko. We hijacked that, updated it, reverse engineered the CPLD, and uh, boom, like you can update the bitstream from the Linux kernel. Now we need root to get into Linux kernel because when you log in, you are in this, uh, you know, like IOSD uh, daemon uh, tenlet uh, shell. And uh, you have to do some kind of privilege escalation to be there. And uh, I started writing protocol fuzzers, you know. It's basically all their protocol fuzz, uh, protocols which have been there for the last 20 years. Uh, so there must be some bug. So while I was doing that, uh, James came in and James said, you know, they are actually writing, they, they manage the iOS uh, process using uh, another process written in Lua. So he went ahead, he figured out two CVs, which got us root, which was basically uh, a command injection and a CSRF uh, bypass. And then uh, the final cost was not 30K, 40K, <laughs> because demo gods also wanted a sacrifice. And uh, this is how 40K looks like. But <laughs> later on, Actually, Cisco said, we're going to replace all these routers to you. But then we found out there was actually 50K worth of loss, which we don't know how it happened. Uh, <laughs> uh, they did give us two routers, so thanks, Cisco. Um, and what is the mitigation? So I was looking at, you know, they released a patch after three months. And uh, what they did was, in order to program SPI, right, like FPGA emulates itself as SPI. And uh, what they did was they are now uh, not allowing the SPI select line to be selected. So there is no way to update FPG, which I don't believe. Uh, and uh, in order to fix current ones, they have to actually send uh, someone to desolder the chip. You know, there is no, if, if, if this has been exploited in the wild, uh, you have to desolder the chip and uh, apply the patch. Uh, and you know, the select line is uh, kept low. But the main problem here is that there is still a mutable root of trust. And there is a way to update this. Uh, and we know how to do it. it just needs some time and more money. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I want to show uh, this demo, which, because I didn't want to bring another router. Uh, humidity can cost $60,000. <laughs> so uh, if you look at this, So th this is when FPGA boots up, uh, shows like this, uh, you know, shows the uh, status of the system integrity. And uh, this is looking good. Uh, nothing wrong in it. It boots up, um, you know, validates, does the whole secure boot chain, uh, loads up the IOSD. And now we're going to use the exploit to get root. Those are the CVE numbers. And then once you get the root, we're going to you know, in smart or quack or KO, which will send commands to, you know, SPI rat commands to the FPGA SPI. And, uh, and we're going to upgrade the ROM on, uh, which is basically updating those two SPI flashes, which contains the bootloader, which gives us persistence. And this is, so I, I, you know, we could have removed this because this all exists in the bootloader now because, and we control the bootloader. I kept it to make sure that, you know, to show you that FPGA did calculate the hash, updated the status of the register, which the bootloader is reading, and it is supposed to now reset. But we stopped the FPGA pin to become one from zero, right? And 
even though you know, FPGA is supposed to be the master, we have controlled it. We can also control any kind of other pins which are going in. We can, you know, like uh, the way FPGA is reading the SPI bus, we can control the SPI data lines and basically show it's perf perfectly, you know, like whatever detection tool they have built or, you know, if, if other people, you know, other people like write something to figure out what's going on, we can actually control the data lines and we can, you know, emulate the right software. Um, and uh, so to show you, I, I have some picture. The guy, that guy is not here. Uh, and uh, we have, you know, it's upgrading the, this is doing the bootloader upgrade because it's two SPI flashes, you update one flash from the SPI and this is, we have persistence. And uh, billions of dollars of research compromised. Um, uh, so future work is, uh, you know, there is uh, FPGA uh, have some kind of compression, you know, they apply and uh, it messes up with the layout of the system, which we want to look into. There are hardware trojans, you can, you know, there is no way to validate the fact that, you know, you can have authentication built into the FPGAs these days. But uh, I think like recently F-Secure guys also found problems in those authentic authentication and confidentiality. Uh, uh, you know, validating that. So there are ways to add hardware trojans in it. Uh, you can also use Fontana because, you know, the clock speed is like around 400 megahertz or something. And uh, this is our GitHub repo. Thank you. All right, well, uh, we have about 10 minutes to clear out of here, but the lucky news here is that uh, we have the beach luau going on right now. There's tons of food out there. Go head on out there. Uh, we'll be out there in a little bit and uh, do some closing remarks out on the beach. So uh, please uh, get the hell out of here. <laughs>